Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, How Encouraging AI Use Will Benefit Your Organization. I'm Allison Ryder, Senior Project Editor of MIT SMR, where I project manage our Big Ideas Research Programs, and I'll be moderating today's session, which is presented in collaboration with BCG. And for a little bit of context on our program, um, just a couple of quick notes about our speaker. So very excited to bring together Sam Ransbotham and Francois Candelone, two co-authors of our recent um, AI and business strategy report. Sam is a professor of analytics at the Carroll School of Management at Boston College. He is guest editor for MIT SMR's Artificial Intelligence and Business Strategy Big Ideas Initiative. Francois Candelone is a senior partner and managing director at the Boston Consulting Group. He is also the global director of the BCG Henderson Institute. So I've had the pleasure of working alongside these two co-authors as well as a much larger team that we would be um, spending the entire time um, thanking if we were to acknowledge everyone, but a large group of people who helped us put together this research uh, that we're excited to share some highlights of with you today. So with that, uh, before we kick things off with the presentation, we did want to ask you all a question. So we have a poll for you. And we'll leave this up for about a minute, give you a chance to respond. But we're curious, how much are you using AI now in your job? We're going to be deliberately vague and not give you too much context about what we mean. So just think about, do you not really use AI? Do you use it a ton? Somewhere in the middle? Uh, give us a, a sense of how much you think you're using it. And so thanks again for joining us. Uh, and we do have a huge number of people here today. Thank you. This, this is great. Um, my voice, this is my voice, is Sam Ransbotham. I'm a professor of analytics, as, as Allison mentioned. For the poll, we're just curious about what you yourself are doing. And so we're going to give you a minute to think and respond. And while you're doing that, I'm going to ask Francois a question and put him on the spot. Uh, so Francois was recently at Web Summit presenting our research with another co-author, Dave Kieron. And I haven't really talked to Francois much about how that went. So How'd it go? What did you learn there? So thank you, thank you, Sam. So and uh, you can see, as I'm French, I have a very different accent. But uh, no, it was uh, great to be at the uh, at the Web Summit, and um, it was all about uh, generative AI, and it was all about Dali. Everyone being very excited about uh, GPT-4 coming and its uh, trillions of parameters. Um, so, but but I must admit that I'm extremely excited as well by generative AI. But maybe for a a different reason, uh, because you, as you know, uh, Sam, I'm really uh, uh, worried about the uh, adoption of AI and how to democratize it, and it's uh, very uh, something that is uh, critical to me. And uh, and I think that generative AI could play that role, as it is uh, a pre-trainer purpose algorithm, and that therefore requires uh, less uh, few few data and 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 few data scientists. So, but we'll see what happens. So I see that we have already the 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 uh, the, uh, the results coming. Yeah. So I've closed out the poll. If we want to take a look at this, I'm just curious how it's aligning. We asked this very same question of our survey respondents. We surveyed about 1,741 people, as I recall. Some of those folks might be on this call. Um, asked them the very same question, and, and we're just taking a look at how this benchmarks against how our global survey population thought about this. It's actually, let's say, a bit lower uh, when I look. I, I mean that, uh, if I remember the numbers, it's more on the moderate amount where we have uh, less, because we, we have the exact same question, so to our uh, 1,700 um, executives. And, um, and as you see here, we can see that we have 34% um, uh, uh, that use it at least moderate or significantly or extensively. Um, but what was interesting as well um, was that um, when we asked the same question, uh, let's say, um, or something a bit similar later on, and, and it was critical to see that out of the 66% uh, people think, reporting that they don't use AI at all, 43% were actually using it because they are using Siri, they are using uh, Salesforce Einstein, um, and so on. And so when you add up this number, because 43% multiplied by 66 equals 29, and when you add this 29% to the 34% I was mentioning, it means that you have at least 63% um, you have today 63% of, of people using AI at least moderately. 
and um, with Sam, we've been working on this for a long period of time. It's a massive shift compared to what we were facing a, a few years back. But but it is true that um, not everyone is aware um, about it, um, and it's true because it's uh, quite pervasive and not uh, always uh, made, uh, let's say, clear that you use AI. And and this is why we try to select different types. Uh, of AI. So, uh, of course, you have general consumer products with AI components like Siri or Alexa. You have general business products with AI components like Salesforce and Shine, um, I was mentioning. And then you have a series of customized AI solutions, AI based solutions. And uh, I remember um, having uh, interviewed people at DHL where they have look, tools helping optimize plane loads or at KLM. Uh, the 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 Dutch airline that to help manage uh, the potential effects of flight cancellations on on multiple functional areas. So so I think that's very important to see that today AI is embedded into many um, many tools that we are not always aware of it. But if there are on this slide two things I would like you to to remember is one when you add up everyone at least 63% of people use AI at least moderately. And second, that it's important as well to promote cognizant AI use. It's key for employees because what we found in our uh, survey is that when you use AI knowingly, you are 1.6 times as likely to derive value from it as people who do not. So it's something that is important and we will uh, we'll see why. And uh, I give the 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 the... the Let's see. I give the word back to uh, back to Sam. All right. Thanks, Francois. Yeah. So we, I think this is fascinating. These poll results and the survey results are really interesting because they're just starting to give us insight into how people are using AI, and this is huge. Um, you know, Francois, you know, we were thinking over the last few years, we've heard this storyline developing about how our human relationship to this technology is evolving, and one concern is always replacement. And, you know, an initial story was that AI was going to replace people, but I think everyone has quickly realized how difficult that entire replacement will be. Entirely replacing humans is, is really tough. But so instead, I think we've all started thinking about task replacement more than job replacement. And certainly some tasks are much more amenable to AI than other tasks. We're likely to get AI benefits from some tasks much more quickly than with others. But this line of reasoning leads to comments like AI won't replace people, but people who use AI will replace people who do not use AI. I really, I really like that sentiment because it recognizes that AI is a tool. AI itself does nothing. And what matters is how we humans use that tool. What matters is how we use AI. But as Francois just described, lots of people are already using, and I, you know, like Francois, deeply suspect that we're underreporting this because a lot of people may not be realizing that they're using AI. Using AI just isn't a binary thing. It isn't an on and off. It may not be in your face. Lots of variation and choice. Um, what I do want to focus on is how people are actually getting value from AI. So we found our insight into how people are getting a value from AI in what may be a, let's say, a surprising or an unlikely source, and that's the psychology, social psychology's self-determination theory. It's a foundation of human motivation and people's innate growth tendencies. And the concept of self-determination holds that people will have three basic psychological needs. They need to feel competent, they need to feel autonomous, and they need to feel related to others. And we thought that this could help us understand how people are getting value from AI. So I'll give you an illustration that goes through these components quickly, and then we'll go into detail about each one of them. And the first illustration, comes from a, a company that you sort of initially might not expect you know, or immediately associate with AI, and that's Land of Lakes. So Land of Lakes is a large member-owned cooperative agribusiness. And they make lots of products. They make particularly dairy products that many of you may know. But what you may not know is that at Land of Lakes, farmers are using data and AI to make smarter decisions than they've ever made before. And it's not hypothetical, it's working. For example, over the past 30 years, corn farmers have used advances in biotech engineering and chemicals and analytics to boost their average yields from 50% uh, by 
from like 120 bushels to 180 bushels per acre, and that's big. But these advances kind of pale in comparison with future corn yields that Land O'Lakes thinks we can get from using AI. They've got demonstrations that promise to triple that average, going from like 180 bushels per acre to 540 bushels per acre. And that's by the end of this decade. What I like about the Land O'Lakes example is that many of these benefits aren't hypothetical. We're already seeing them. They're using extensive experimentation and complex algorithms. They're trying to provide AI-driven recommendations to help individual farmers be more productive. And so when we talked with Teddy Bekele, he was the, he's still the CTO of Land of Lakes, we had a fascinating discussion about what kinds of things that they're doing. And what really struck us was how those three components of self-determination theory resonated through the examples that Teddy gave. On this slide, we've got some examples here of ways that we see that Land of Lakes is tied to self-determination theory through competency, autonomy, and relationships. I mean, I really like this example. I think it's a great example. But I want to illustrate that we have not cherry-picked this example. We found links to each of the other three components of self-determination theory in other companies and in our survey data. So I can break down each one of these components uh, with a few examples for each. First, competency is about making better decisions. Self-determination theory says that ind individuals derive value when they feel more competent. They need to feel competent in how they perform their job. I mean, we, we just don't like technologies that make us feel dumb. Uh, it's just no, no fun. I, I know that I don't. Um, we were frustrated getting some aspects of this webinar getting, getting going earlier this morning, and it just isn't fun to feel dumb. But using AI can help employees feel more competent in their job in several ways. And some examples from our report that you may want to check out are, one, making better decisions to exploit business opportunities. Our example there came from a discussion I had with Sarah Carthigan, who was then at ExxonMobil. And she was describing how geophysicists make complicated decisions about where and how to extract oil. And then she talked more about how ExxonMobil uses AI to help identify those right patterns and augment the decisions that these geoscientists or geophysicists make. And then with greater confidence in those decisions, they can move faster. So, you know, their use of AI is not in a task replacement framing. It's more about finding and improving confidence in these new opportunities. Second example is that AI can help people anticipate and avoid unwanted outcomes. Our example there is from Nationwide Insurance. And I talked with Bradley Coy. And he described how important it was for claims adjusters to identify fraud, but also how important it was to avoid falsely accusing people of fraud. And that's a tricky spot to be in. And it's complicated by having just tons of data. But all this data really helps if people have assistance from AI tools. And so the ability to learn and process all this information really helps prevent fraud and avoid negative attention and improve client, client interactions. And I like these examples because these aren't isolated. You know, we see overall that people who use AI-based suggestions are 1.8 times as likely to derive value from AI as those who don't. Employees who are in organizations that invest in AI to improve the quality of decisions are one and a half times as likely to get value, individual value from AI. So these are important and meaningful differences. So our first kind of key point is that individuals derive value from AI through greater competence. Second, self-determination theory says that individuals derive value through increased autonomy. If you think about jobs, Almost all jobs take time to learn to do without guidance. Um, I teach classes in machine learning and analytics, and I like to quote a statistic that I just made up, which is that exactly 0% of the people are born knowing how to do analytics and artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, I did make up that statistic, but I do think it's true. Um, but using AI can help people improve to be better at their jobs, but also more autonomous in their jobs. So despite some of the narrative that automation might make people feel redundant or subservient to the machines, 
Our research indicates that working with AI affords individuals more autonomy rather than less. I think that's a big deal. Um, <clears throat> AI tools can help people. Uh, they can help them learn from past actions. They can help project the outcomes of current actions. We've got a couple of statistics up here about using AI to improve performance and recommended and to recommend new actions. People are using these, and it doesn't just improve their competence. It actually makes them work more independently, independently. And these are exactly the kinds of uh, tools that I think AI can help with that steers us away from this replacement thinking. So our second point is that individuals derive value from AI because it just helps them be more autonomous. The third point of self-determination theory says that individuals derive value through stronger relationships. And we have a like a mental image of people using technology that, I don't know, like sitting in a green, you know, staring at a green screen and uh, like in a cave in troglodyte mode. And this um, this troglodyte mode isn't isn't good and it isn't healthy. But self-determination theory holds that individuals have a psychological need to interact with or to work with other people. So people don't find value in technologies that make them feel isolated or solitary. Um, so using AI can help, and we got some statistics up on the screen um, about how it's helping people connect more with their team members. 56% of the people say that. Uh, managers, they can connect better with their managers or even others in their department. So these are not isolated sort of isolating technologies. Instead, they're strengthening relationships both inside and outside organizations. So inside organizations, um, I talked with David Tao at the Global you know, World Wildlife Fund, and they're using AI in tons of ways. They're processing satellite images to help forest conservation. They're doing language processing on policy documents. They're identifying species with motion sensing cameras. I mean, there's just all kinds of stuff that they're doing. I had no idea. But what, with so many applications, it turns out that lots of people within the World Wildlife Fund may not be aware of how their coworkers are using similar technologies. And so to address this, World Wildlife Fund is documenting all the ways that they're using AI and to help build this common link between people within the organization. It doesn't just mean within the organization, it also extends to customers. Um, another great example came from a discussion I had with uh, Estee Lauder. Uh, so Somya Gotapati uh, at the time was telling us how th what they're trying to do is, for example, help clients try on 30 different shades of lipstick in 30 seconds, but then an individual beauty advisor can help them narrow those options to just two or three. So with these two tools working together, it's helping build a better relationship with their customers. So one interesting finding here is that and visual, that these tools help people relate to others. And this is, I think, an important thing. So individuals are deriving value from using AI because those technologies help strengthen relationships. And so I'm going to switch over to, back to Francois and just I've described how AI is helping competence and autonomy and relationships. And I think Francois is now going to spend some time thinking about how some of our findings help inform what organizations and managers can do to increase the likelihood of others getting value from AI. So I will then switch over to Francois. Uh, so uh, thank, thanks a lot, Sam, and, and thank you for uh, explaining how this improves self-autonomy is actually, we are with this very far from the, uh, the common narrative that uh, companies get value from AI at the expense of their, of their employees. And, um, and, and it was really even, I would say, on the contrary, because companies are more likely to derive values, value when, when employees do as well. And, and we found, as you can see on, on this slide, that it's almost, they are almost six times as likely to get significant financial benefit from AI compared to uh, with organizations where, where employees do not get value from AI. And, and to be a bit more specific, we with the um, with the uh, with some values. In fact, we found that only seven percent of employees 
claim that their company achieves value from AI, while they get little or no value from using it, and 64% employees reported even that they were personally benefiting from the technology. So very different from the, the narrative that we, we usually um, hear. And so the, uh, the next question is, once we say that uh, it's great to get value out of it, so the, 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 the key question for an organization is, how can managers encourage AI value and, and how they should do it? Because um, it's clear that ensuring employees use AI is clearly not automatic because you, as you know, when you still have preconceived notions about AI, it prevents you from willingly using it. And it's important that managers ignite what I call a, a virtuous cycle of use and value. That is, the more people use AI, the more values they derive from it, and the more they perceive the benefits, the more prone they are to using it. And to do so, uh, managers have several tools. Uh, some which are well-established measures like cultivating trust in AI or making sure, making sure employees understand how it works, and some others that are a bit less appreciated approaches like mandating AI or ensuring a cognizant use of AI. So what I propose is maybe that we go through these levers one by one. So, and, and let's start with the way managers can promote awareness. Because, uh, as I, I previously mentioned, uh, many employees underestimate how much they use AI. And I'm sure you will tell me, okay, but does it really matter? Because as long as employees are using the solutions, they can benefit from it. But this is not true. We found that it can limit how they perceive the values they derive from AI. As you can see on that slide, employees using AI knowingly are 1.6 times as likely to get individual value and 1.8 times as likely to be satisfied with their jobs compared with those who do not realize they use AI. And, and I think this is a very important point, especially at the moment when we have a talent war. Um, it's really critical for employees to be aware um that they use ai and and it can be done different way um one that i like a lot is the fact that managers can signal ai use by leading by example for instance we found that uh, in that case employees are 3.4 times as likely to boost regular usage when managers signal ai use by leading by example or they could as well institutionalize uh, AI because uh, you can have the, have AI mentioned in different business strategies and communicated upon throughout the organization. So very important and critical to promote awareness. And here the, 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 the question is as well, it's good to have awareness and it's good to create and encourage a greater understanding. Because what we found is that people who understand how to work is a, with AI and can explain how it operates are 1.7 times as likely to derive individual value from AI. And I, I want to give the, the example of uh, Levi Strauss and Co. Um, that holds uh, boot camps for their employees. And, and what they found uh, after running some of these trainings where the frontline workers learn how to use AI they realized that these employees emerge not only with a new understanding of what AI can do, but also with a new sense of what they themselves are capable of with AI. And therefore, they become great advocates of AI, and it has a massive impact on the company's culture towards the technology. So, next slide. So, then something that is well known is the ability or the need to promote trust on AI. And, it, and it's true that uh, what is for sure is that uh, employees who do not trust AI will be reluctant to, to use it. And on the contrary, uh, as you can see, trust is really a, a powerful driver of AI use because uh, 
individuals who trust AI are 2.1 times as likely to use it regularly as individuals who do not trust the technology. Uh, but what is for sure as well is that trust is not an easy sentiment to nurture. And um, one of the, the, the common solutions to, to create it uh, is to foster transparency and interpretability. Uh, as you can see, individuals who can interpret AI outcomes are almost three times as, like, as likely to trust the technology compared with individuals who cannot interpret it. And, and this is very important, and this is why in any transformation, for instance, that I do, um, it brings the trade-off about should, when I design AI, a trade-off between accuracy and explainability. And uh, I have plenty of examples of, of that. And, and especially at the beginning, I try to favor, favor explainability because this is the real way to create the trust that will then push to the next level. And, and, and here is uh, um, the, the, this opportunity because we all know um, that uh, the worst day of AI is day one uh, because you haven't trained it in real life. It was trained on some, uh, let's say, uh, data sets, but now you're in real life and you know that it will start. And uh, I was mentioning the DHL uh, tool uh, to, to load planes and, and really it's, uh, it was massive the way uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the workers were a little bit worried at the beginning, but then were open because they were able to see the value. And what happened here is really that there was, there were, it was a mandating use. Um, and despite this mandating use, it still leads to individual value. And because once people start using AI, they see the value. And as such, we found that employees are 1.4 times as likely to get value from AI when organizations require them to use AI as when the, the latter do not. And, and so, as we see, mandating AI is a very powerful tool. It triples the likelihood that employees will use AI regularly. But however, something that is important is good to push for this mandating um, for this uh, mandated use of, a, of AI but at the same time it's important that individual will have the ability to override AI because if they do that they are more than twice as likely to regularly use AI as those who are not able to to override it so I, I think that these four elements are to show the need to embark into this virtual cycle of use and value, the more you use it, the more you see the value, and the more you see the value, then the, you, the more you perceive the benefits, the more prone you are to use it. Thanks, Francois. Uh, we've given you many examples, and we've got a lot more examples in our report. In short, our main findings are that individual from AI is, value from AI is critical for organizations to obtain that value from AI. That's a virtual cycle that Francois was just talking about. And individuals, they benefit from AI when the technology enhances their competence, autonomy, and relationships. These are hallmarks of self-determination theory, and we, we like that link there. And then third, managers can do lots of things to encourage AI use and to try to improve this value creation. Um, Francois went through four examples there of trust, agency, understanding, and awareness. But now we're curious what questions or comments that you have. Feel free to submit those and we'll get to as many questions as we can. And while you're thinking about those questions, um, Francois is going to tie, you know, link what we just talked about today to the overarching research program that we've been working on the last few years. Yeah, so I, I think I, I wanted just to highlight that this report, we've been partnering with, um, with MIT SMR and with Sam for a much more than that, but but I think that it's important to consider that this report is, I would say, part of a trilogy of reports that were really expanding on the question about human plus AI and how to make the best use of human and AI together. And so in 2020, we, we looked at what we call the organizational learning, meaning what AI and humans can 
learn from each other and this organizational learning was actually the is actually the trigger for a much better return on investment or uh, of um, AI uh, AI use. Uh, this is uh, the first one. La last year we highlighted what we call the hidden cultural benefits uh, of AI um, because you uh, very often CEOs believe that uh, the culture of their company might prevent them from deploying AI. But what we found is almost the reverse. By deploying AI, they transform the culture of their company and make it much, let's say, uh, much more with a much higher performance. So, and, and there are not that many uh, technology that can claim at the same time that they, put, they create significant financial benefits and uh, much, uh, let's say, a high performance culture. So it was last year and this year, as we've discussed, is about, uh, uh, for, we went from the organization to the uh, the team and now to the individual and understanding the the cri how critical the human factor and the uh, the behavioral uh, behavioral science are for uh, is for uh, for uh, for uh, this new colleague which is AI. Uh, if we could bring up our cameras, we are moving into the Q and A portion of our program now. In the meantime, I think there have been some great questions. I think a lot hovering around the self-determination theory organization that we've applied to this research, as well as kind of some basic definitions of what different elements mean. Uh, so it might be helpful. We had a, a question about what we mean by AI tools, what we mean by AI use. So maybe uh, if one of you would talk us through, we had actually segmented different AI tools into four use cases or scenarios. If you could maybe walk us through what those are, what types of tools we were asking about, and maybe some context around the kind of relative um, use of each of those. That would be interesting. I can do that if you want. Um, so okay. ba ba basically we had a, we conceptualized four types, the, uh, the um, general consumer products with AI components. So it's like Siri, Alexa, or Grammarly, so it's, it relates to products that are more uh, such as uh, voice assistants, writing apps, calendar schedules. So it's really something that, that you do all the time. You have the, 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 the general business products with AI components, um, and they cover a, a wide range of uh, business applications. So you have uh, off-the-shelf uh, imaging tools that support radiologists, or you have CRM software uh, such as Salesforce is Einstein, and I refer to that one not because I uh, uh, <laughs> I like Salesforce, but because I believe that it is a very powerful tool that is really where AI is embedded, but it's, which is very easy to consume, uh, I would say. And, and I think this is not because it's easy to work with that you don't have sophisticated algorithm, I would say, or more the, uh, the opposite. And then you have a large range of customized AI-based solutions that are either dedicated to a function. I was referring to uh, the DHL, uh, DHL the DHL tool on, um, to optimize plane loads. Uh, you have many others, uh, and you can find them as well in our uh, different reports, But and some others which are more um, multi-functions. But there is this question about generic versus customized, and then more consumer or uh, broad versus targeted. One thing I think it's tricky about this is that when we ask people about AI, they tend their mind tends to go to these last examples that Francois mentioned, these overarching huge examples that are organization wide and have like AI in your face. But the reality is that it's it's much more pervasive than that. And one way to think about that is we've just gotten so used to technologies doing things for us. Uh, an example I like is like spell check and grammar. You ask people if they're using AI and they'll say no, but then they you know, clearly they're using spelling and grammar checking just ubiquitously. I think if you went back in the 1700s and you told somebody that their writing quill, the ink would turn red when you misspelled a word in their writing quill, they would call that witchcraft because it, it would be so amazing. But that's not amazing to us at all now. So. What happens, I think, is we get inured to those technologies. And they, what is AI can't be something that we're doing right now, 
because AI has to be something amazing and wonderful. And some of the first uses that, that Francois mentioned were these more common uses, I think is this you know, insidious creep, and insidious in a good way, is there a good word for insidious? This pervasive creep of technologies into our lives. Yes. And, and, really? and what I, maybe to add one more thing about that, and there is one example that I like with what uh, the, uh, the F Finland has been doing um, with creating modes to make people understand what AI is and what AI can do and cannot do. And I believe this is very important because the more you know, the less you're scared. It's true for AI, it's true for many other things as well. And, um, and, and by doing this, not only you are able to develop the understanding of what of the limits and therefore to be less scared on one hand and on the other hand, it promotes the use of it. And uh, as we've seen, uh, by promoting the use, you see more value and you make your company more, uh, let's say, more, more, more competitive. And then as we think about, we organize the study around, you know, kind of um, post facto, we said, hey, wait a minute, these, these different use cases tied to these elements of self-determination theory, right? So we have confidence, autonomy, relationships, um, relation to others. A couple of questions about autonomy. So I'm wondering if you could break that down, like unpack that a little. Does that mean working more independently? Does, is that tied to decision making? Is it all of the above? Like how, how do you define it in the constraints of, uh, or within the constraints of how we ask the questions about AI use? Me? So, Maybe I'll start. I'll, <laughs> go ahead, Francois. No, 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 no. I think that usually um, what I, uh, one of my uh, good friends uh, at BCG, Yves Morieu, who is a sociologist, used, and it has nothing to do with behavioral science, <laughs> because for him it's a, it's a big word, but um, is to, is you, is saying, okay, that the role of a manager is to make you do things that you would not do otherwise. And to a certain extent, with the support of AI, individuals, employees will do things that they would not do otherwise because they get the AI recommendation. So I think that to a certain extent, at least for some of what they do, um, AI could be a good substitute to some of the management, um, let's say the, the, the management, the requirements from the, from the managers. And, and, and this is why I think to a certain extent, as long as you have the agency, to a certain extent, it creates more autonomy. Right, and, that and agency is a big deal. Example. Yeah, agency is a big deal because we don't like technologies that are impressive or tell us what to do. But it's maybe to tie the last couple of answers together, we're all used to using uh, map software to route us to different locations. And that's a very common use. We don't have to follow that. You know, the, the map can tell us one thing and we can do something else, but I think which much more likely to trust and benefit from these technologies when we have that still uh, human ability to, to, to have agency. Yeah, and, and I think just to give one example, um, we worked for a consumer good company and uh, uh, we, we, we use an AI uh, tool to help the salespeople know which store they should visit and which next best action they should have, which offer they should propose. And, and at the beginning, they were a little bit reluctant, but because they perceived the value, they were very happy. And to a certain extent, they felt that they were enhanced, and mm -hmm. which is more related to, uh, to competence. But it was a mix of both. It was competence on one hand and autonomy because together with this colleague, they were uh, able to uh, to deal with and, and achieve their results and their objectives much faster. That's helpful context too, thank you. As we think about relatedness to others, um, someone had asked, well, could this improvement in relatedness maybe be a temporary phenomenon? And it's tied more to adopting AI might feel novel. And once we see more kind of um, acceptance or just that these tools or a specific tool or initiative is commonplace, do you predict that would change? We can't see the future. We could ask this question in a year on our next study and, and get that data and actually give a real answer there. But curious if, if you think that might be the case or if, if any interviews corroborated, you know, what types of scenarios improve relatedness? Uh, I, I think we have a question already for next year, don't we? Uh, I think that's, that is a, I think that 
there's probably truth to the novelty is creating a, a foxhole or a a shared shared experience using the technology that's helping people connect each other but yes that novelty might dwindle but you know i don't know i think i'm more uh, i think i might see the trend go, going the other way because if you think about how we're then able to focus on the business problems rather than the technology then i think that's going to be an opportunity to connect uh, even more um, maybe we don't want to talk about the technology and that will get us to the meat of the problem quicker yes and and on the other side what we can add and it's another other side of the of the same coin which is that with ai as you are more likely to eliminate a certain number of issues uh you can think that it will create let's say the relationship with others will be smoother and we have this example that we uh, discussed last year about uh, klm and the fact that they were able with AI to tag the uh, the pieces of luggage that were uh, of people yeah. were more likely to be late because whatever and and basically thanks to it, it the, the relationship with the uh, the the um, the, uh, the, 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 the the people in the stewards in the in the aircraft and the people on the ground were actually much smoother and the relationship with the stewardess or a steward with uh, uh, with the passengers as well. With, so, so I think that the relationship within the company, the, the, the flight attendants, was much better, and therefore it creates a much smoother relationship and so a, a stronger sense of relatedness. That's what I wish I'd said. That's a great answer. <laughs> That's a great answer. I tell you, the answer is not as good. Where I was just going to, of course, note that with our technical issues today, it brought Sam and I much closer. You know, we're yeah. frantically messaging each other texting in the background and hopefully no one even perceives that so you never know as these things start to work better are we going to be distant and not communicate as much maybe maybe not make as many jokes later or, or have as many drinks after um well actually sorry one more thought there is that we all have a limited time budget i mean we that's that's a fundamental human problem is the 24 hours a day that we have and we can stay up a little later or drink a little more coffee but what comes down to is how we use those hours and to the degree that the use of these technologies allow us to use our time less on routine aspects and more on non-routine, I think that that gets into exactly what Francois was saying about developing these uniquely human connections. Yeah, but, but, but despite this, I would like us to be aware that if we are not careful, we can create what I could call the 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 the, the new Mo Charlie Chaplin's new modern times, uh, because you can give to humans the tasks that are not easy, that are really difficult, complex. Uh, you see that in some call centers where you just give to uh, you have AI and chatbots replying to easy questions, and so as a human, you are facing the very difficult one. So. <laughs> The fact that, as we we're saying, Alison, uh, that maybe you need to you be you need to be careful as well not to have people just being on their own and being located and and interacting with humans, uh, with other humans. So, so I believe that we should not be uh, say uh, let's say so no no it's great everything is great. There are some issues. There are ways to deal with them, uh, but. On average, and if we deal with what I've said and some other uh, constraints to avoid the new modern times, I think this is a fantastic opportunity to to do what you said, Sam, and to limit the issues uh, and to make people focus on, uh, let's say, higher value add questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking too, if we look back to our study last year, we talked about the cultural benefits of AI in the enterprise and our survey respondents said, well, using AI makes me feel I can collaborate better. I have better learning opportunities in my organization. So we have real data too that talks about similarly to relatedness to others, just how people are interacting at the team level, at the organizational level as a result of using technologies. Um, what was a little more different this year was just a more of a laser focus on the individual specifically and, and their attitudes. And you know, then we tie that to how it ladders up to organizational performance. But I think for people interested in those questions, seeing the last two reports as companions to each other might be a useful exercise. Mm -hmm. So,
sticking with the kind of people angle, uh, a question about um, industry and, and culture. Have we found, and this might even bring us back to year one of our study, as we've talked about adoption more generally, and we, we track that over a series of years, how how and, and to what degree your organization's adopting artificial intelligence, to what ends. Are we finding in any of this research that adoption varies by industry or by elements of culture? Um, that might come up more through interviews than than survey data, but um, on the culture side. But that that was an interesting question. Um, you know, and are there markers of culture that would suggest that AI adoption would be more successful? I'm not sure who. Uh, the, so certainly yeah, there are. As the lead interviewer on a lot of these. <laughs> Uh, certainly, there are variations. I mean, I'd be much more surprised by homogeneity than I would be in variation. And many of the industries that we see, the technology-heavy industries, tend to jump on these technologies first. On the other hand, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity to, you know, in, in many of these industries that are perhaps uh, not as quick to, to, to adopt technologies, and things like human resources tends to be slower than than other industry, uh, other functional areas, for example. Um, there's still a lot of opportunity there. And I think that's the opportunity that, that maybe Francois and I are excited about. Because if you think about the, you know, the cultural benefits, the team benefits, the individual benefits, many of these things are very, uh, they're not as technology focused as you might think from people who are studying a, a an intense technology. No, that, that, that's true, but at the same time, we need to recognize that for SMEs uh, or for, uh, let's say, incumbents, uh, you don't know exactly how to deal with data. It's very difficult to hire data scientists. So, I, I mean, we need to recognize that it's not that easy. And this is where, as we were mentioning during the, the first part of the conversation, I think that generative AI could give a boost to the adoption of AI, especially at an SME level. Uh, and in industries that are less advanced, uh, technolo te less technologically, less advanced technologically. Yeah, I mean, I, so I think your SME example is a good one because it thinks about us in terms of sizes and access mm -hmm. to resources. But the other part of access to resources is that we can go out and get the latest technologies easily. Um, you know, an example that I do in class is that we will we will download these technologies that would have been cutting edge research just a few years ago, and we can download them for free and use them in real time in class. That's going to help disproportionately, I think, the current SMEs who may not, you know, may not be the upper echelons of technology right now. You can have a mom and pop restaurant and yes. get access to those technologies, and I think that's actually very interesting. Um, I fully dynamic. agree. I don't know. I don't know how that's going to play out, but I think that's going to be a very interesting dynamic. Yeah, I fully agree. I fully agree. And I had when I was living in China. I've been living in China for uh, almost a decade. In uh, let's say, and uh, and really, you were able to see the way um, um, Alibaba or other companies were helping we're digitizing mom and pop shops to get data and so on but at the end it was win-win and um, and i think this is one of the reasons why we see um with this uh, what we could call maybe vertical ai ecosystems we see that china in terms of adoption of ai is much more advanced than what we see in the in the west it's going to bring up different way. things that are scarce I mean, what, what it changes is when some, some parts of technologies that used to be scarce now become ubiquitous, then it changes what's scarce. And I think that's a challenge for all of us is to try to think ahead and think about what's going to be the new scarcity. Um, lots of opinions there. I'd like Absolutely. to jump to trust for a minute. So a couple questions around that area. I think, you know, it's understood Managers can promote trust in solutions. We see the data that bears out what the benefit is to the organization as a whole when that happens. But if we back up a little bit, this ties into the conversation Sam, you and Shervin have been having on our podcast about you know, various um, elements around bias and transparency and what have you. Are there ways we're seeing organizations assess 
which solutions are trustworthy like how is that part communicated into the organization like you know is it just kind of managers say yeah this is great trust it it's good <laughs> or you know have we seen good examples of how um you know various tools or implementations can be vetted to really back up the fact that these are trustworthy reliable tools that will you know benefit you know good outcomes so what what I maybe I, I start with this what I, what I try to do when I um, I'm working with companies that are starting their AI journey or uh, let's say part of uh, or some BUs or department or function first of all is always to have people to have let's say uh, um, users or consumers of this technology to be part of the design this is one thing the second thing is to make sure that you, uh, as I said, uh, you between accuracy and trade-off and uh, explainability, you favor explainability, uh, especially at the beginning. This is critical, no doubt, uh, because as we say, if you understand or if you get you get the value and so on, but you understand why and you see the value, then you're entering into this virtual cycle. Um, and the third thing is that when it's too difficult and so on, mandate the use of it. Mm -hmm. You explain that, but you go, you tell them, okay, trust me, trust me, or if you don't trust me, I don't care. You trust who you don't trust, do it. And but with this ability to then you the uh, make it make it work and and give them the use of um, trust will come. Honestly. I haven't seen any case when trust was not coming after use of it. Well, right, I'm welcoming uh, maybe some of the attendees might have different perspectives and I'm welcoming it. But if you do this, yeah. if you embark with advocates, with uh, business people who will use it and that will be then advocates. And you are, if you're promoting the explainability and then you, and if not, you are pushing for the you saying okay trust me we will do that and we come back in six months i haven't seen anyone moving back uh, moving backward yeah kind of you try it and then then the, the technology will prove itself out i think a different example that came up a different way of thinking about this was the example in our report about munich reinsurance uh and so they did a great job of coming up with a way of external vetting of the accuracy of models. And so that is another way of, of showing that it's not just it's not just we say our models are good, but there's a external body saying that these these models are good. And I think that's an interesting dynamic that will only explode. I mean, I think we've made the analogy before that uh, food production in the United States got much safer through the course of food inspections and FDA uh, inspections and restaurant inspections. Uh, we trust stocks in companies because we know they're audited by external people. We don't have any very little of that with technology algorithms. And I think there's a huge opportunity for for that. And I'm, I'm not advocating for massive regulation, but I think some sunshine and scrutiny can help say that it's a technology that others say is OK, not just a vested first party. Makes sense. Thank you. I like to ask a question like this. So thankfully, someone has submitted one to this effect. Um, mm -hmm. full, you know, appreciate the presentation, fully understand the benefits of AI, but how do I get started? Um, how do I go about starting to learn to use various applications? Who out there offers resources on this? I mean, I can think of a couple people on this on this <laughs> webinar, but you know, are there any other kind of key first steps you would think about about bringing organizations up to speed about how to start this process of okay i want to bring some ai into my organization where do i even begin so what i what i would say is that the the, the point ai is a tool is an enabler so the key question you face is about okay what are my big business questions what should I solve? And then you look and go and see whether AI is a good enabler for it. And if you need to have, let's say, a large number of real-time decisions to be made, this is one thing. If you are, um, you need to scale very quickly, 
it's another reason. Um, if you believe that through, con con through a continuous learning, you will be in a much better position. And if you think that there are either patterns or by you could be much more granular, AI can be a microscope of your data, helping you find patterns that otherwise you would not see. And it is a great opportunity as well. It has great capabilities to forecast, to better predict what might happen. So, so I think that when you think about all of this, you need to revisit your business model and see how these um, specific capabilities could help you rethink your entire business model. So, um, but then start with a couple of use cases where this is really interesting and then but but start thinking big so start small but think big all right and then you know, maybe to reject the question a little bit you know how do we you start with ai you're you're already started you, mm. what about starting with identifying some of the areas that you're already using it and highlight those as cases uh, then you can expand to to these smaller cases and larger larger cases. I guess one other cautionary tale we've heard is the idea of over AIing some part of the business and leaving the rest of it uh, kind of in, <laughs> stuck in the in the 1800s. And you know, there's, there's a lot of benefits that come from pulling all parts of the organization along so that then they're able to get those good connections and relationships that, that seem to, to synergistically work together. Yes, and, and one, one more thing, or maybe one last thing, at least from my side, is the fact that AI does not understand silos in the organization. <laughs> so, uh, so it's why I encourage you, because one of the big issues we face is when people are staying at the pilot level. What is important, take one, go end to end, uh, not considering the silos of the organization, making sure that maybe you will have people from these different departments, but really go end to end. Because um, as we used to say um, at BCG, we have our 10, 20, 70% rule, which is in terms of effort, getting a good algo is not that difficult. Infrastructure, 10%, infrastructure and data, 20%, but the big effort is about people and change management, and this is the 70%. Sam, Francois, thank you so much. We are at time, so I'm sorry to stifle this discussion. There are many more questions than we could get to. I will be sharing those with our speakers. Um, you have their contact information in various places. Feel free to reach out with any follow-ups. We're happy to, to chat. Uh, please take a look at the report as well. I linked that in the questions module for folks. I hope you find it interesting and it dives a little bit deeper into these issues, gives you a little bit more context than we had time to present to you all today. But a uh, sincere thanks to all of you for joining us. So thank you again to our speakers. Thank you very much to our collaborative partner on this, Boston Consulting Group. Take care, everyone. Thank you.